grace afford, teach me thy way, help me to walk aright, more by faith, less by sight, lead me with heavenly light, teach me thy way, when I am sad at heart, teach me thy way, when earthly joys depart, teach me thy way, in hours of loneliness, in times of dire distress, in failure or success, teach me thy way. When doubts and fears arise, teach me thy way. When storms o'erspread the skies, teach me thy way. Shine through the clouds and rain, through sorrow, toil, and pain. Make thou my pathway plain, teach me thy way. Long as my life shall last, teach me thy way. When me thy way until the race is run until the journey's done until the crown is won teach me thy way Good morning. So great to see you here this morning on our homecoming Sunday, anniversary Sunday. Would you stand with me and join us, page number 209. Before we do, we're going to sing our theme for the year, Abounding and Increasing. sing the first verse this morning, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. go to the Lord in prayer this time. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your many blessings and thank you for the opportunity to be in this place where we can be encouraged and lifted up by brothers and sisters in Christ. And most importantly, where we can be challenged from your word uh, once again. Lord, thank you for the past 62 years that your word of God has been uh, faithfully preached uh, here in this place. And Lord, we're thankful for how you have used this ministry in the past and how you're using it now. And, Lord, we are thrilled about what you're doing now and, and how you're going to use it in the days to come, Lord. And I pray that you would use this service uh, to draw us close, closer back to you through the singing, uh, through the preaching. Be with our pastor. Uh, fill him with your Holy Spirit and use him in a great way uh, this morning. Lord, would you save the lost this morning? Would you revive 
uh, us and bring us back and closer to you, Lord. And we just give you this day and we give you this service. Thank you so much for your great uh, many blessings that you have bestowed upon our lives. And we just want to say thank you for that. And we want to tell you we love you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated at this time. It is so good to see you here this morning, especially on this anniversary Sunday. If you are a first-time guest, we'd like you to open up your bulletin. And inside there is a connection card where you can fill out uh, some information and, and put that in the offering plate so we can continue to connect with you after this service. And then as you go out in the foyer, we do have a book that we'd love to give you entitled Done. And just to show our appreciation for you being in this service uh, this morning. It's so great to have everyone here uh, this morning on this day. And we're looking forward to how God's going to work in our hearts in this service. At this time, our choir is going to come and minister to our hearts. And they're going to sing a song entitled, Led by the Spirit.
Amen. To God be the glory. We're celebrating 62 years here at Mansfield Baptist Temple. And what a great song to commemorate that. To God be the glory. Everything that's been done here, we want to bring glory to the Lord. And for those who are guests with us, I see a lot of uh, new faces here today. Thank you for coming and being with us on our special Sunday, anniversary Sunday. And we hope that you enjoy the time. We're going to have our offering here in just a minute. And uh, during our offering, we're going to have uh, a special group singing. And then after the offering, we're going to have a homecoming video, and it's a 17-minute video that just shows a little bit about the history of this church, has some testimonies on it. I hope that you'll enjoy that. Uh, We we mentioned this in the the last service, but we had groups going out last week. Uh, We had a group that went to uh, Peru. Eight of our members went down to Peru, and they were part of a medical missions team that went in, a bunch of doctors, nurses, and others helping and from what I understand, they were able to see over 2,700 patients, and they saw around 900 of them come to know Christ in the last week, a uh, little over a week. And what a privilege. I, I haven't been debriefed much about the trip yet. Looking forward to hearing about that. We had our teens, 30, some of them, went down to Pensacola, Florida, to a, a teen camp. I haven't heard much about that, a little bit of a good report there. And we had some in Grenada and some up in Connecticut serving the Lord in different ways. So looking forward to hearing more about all of that. And we'll have some testimonies in future services. But in this service, we hope that uh, those are our guests. Feel welcome. And uh, then we're going to, right after this service, we have a meal prepared. And everyone, including all our guests, are welcome to come over. We're inviting you to come over and eat with us in our, our gymnasium right after the service. A couple prayer requests I want to give you. Sandra Chenier went into the hospital And uh, they found some uh, cancer cells, and uh, she's struggling at this time. Great spirit, great testimony, but she's struggling. Pray for Shirley Funk as well. She's over at Med Central. She's the one that had the knee replacement that she got up and broke a bone in her leg, and now they've had to do another surgery. But uh, pray for her if you would. Pray for Bill Kick. His blood pressure is pretty low. He wanted to be here but not able to, so I ask you to pray for him as well. And many other requests that we're not going to mention at this time. But let's go to the Lord and ask him to to bless our offering. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for our opportunity to be here today. Thank you for an opportunity to give back a portion of what you've given to us. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to bring requests to you. I pray that you'd bless Sandra, Lord Chenier, and uh, Shirley Funk, Bill Kick, Lord, others that are struggling physically at this time, Lord. I just pray that you'd bless our service today. In Jesus' name, amen. When your waters are so troubled, you don't think you count at all. The waves may seem like mountains when your boat is oh so small. But somewhere past the clouds waits a new day to begin. Sometimes it takes a storm to calm the storm within. Sometimes it takes a storm to know you need a shelter. Disappear without a trace Sometimes the wind will rage Before you'll sail calm waters Sometimes it takes a storm To find a hiding place Drifting in the darkness And the sea was all around They cried out to the Master Please save us or we'll drown And Jesus heard their cries And with mercy stilled the wind Sometimes it takes a storm To see the sun again Sometimes it takes a storm To know you need a 
Thank you for that special song. For those who are just joined us by means of our radio broadcasts on WMAN, thank you for listening in. Today is a special day at Mansfield Baptist Temple, 62nd anniversary that we are celebrating. And at this time, we're going to show a video that tells a little bit about the history of Mansfield Baptist Temple. Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and about, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Carved out of America's first Northwest Territory, the rolling green hills of Mansfield, Ohio, were the first settled in 1808. Located in the heart of Ohio, the small village of Mansfield was incorporated in 1828. Then, beginning in 1846, numerous railroad lines transformed this beautiful, hilly region, surrounded by fertile farmlands, into a transportation hub, halfway between the important cities of Cleveland and Columbus. In 1857, Mansfield was chartered as a city. As the years passed, the city grew, and 1913 brought the Lincoln Highway, the first road across America, our modern Route 30, straight through Mansfield. This thoroughfare charted a path for economic and industrial growth. Mansfield's greatest period of industrial development was fueled by the city's stove manufacturing industries, including Westinghouse Electric Corporation and the Tappan Stove Company. Economic and population development was further enhanced with the Mansfield Tire and Rubber Company, Ohio Brass Company, General Motors Fisher Body Stamping Plant, Thermodisc, Gorman Rock, and the Jones Potato Chip Company. By the 1950s, the growing city of Mansfield had expanded not only economically, the community also included many schools, a large hospital and nurses home, museums, and theaters, and was planning the opening of Mansfield Branch of the Ohio State University. However, something of far greater eternal significance commenced in 1951. A small gathering of devout people, led by Reverend Charles W. Rader, gathered together in a storeroom at 108 Orchard Street on May 20th, 1951. This little gathering, known as the Mansfield Baptist Temple Mission, was sponsored by the Akron Baptist Temple. Dr. Dallas F. Billington, founder and pastor of the Akron Baptist Temple, donated 100 chairs and a piano and paid the first month's rent of $110 on the storeroom. On July 1st, 1951, 
with the United Hearts, the small congregation under the leadership of Reverend Rader formed a full-fledged Baptist church and changed the name of their small mission to the Mansfield Baptist Temple. Eleven people came forward that Sunday to join hands and pray that God would establish this new work, that it would be a lighthouse in the Mansfield community and might bring glory and honor to his name. The faith of this small group began to increase as they watched the Lord begin to work. Eric, it seems like we've been here all of our life, but when we were first married, we was looking for a church, and uh, my wife seen a picture of this young preacher starting a new church, and that was in Carpenter School. In 1966, the Mansfield Baptist Temple Auditorium is finished, and the cornerstone is laid. One of the funny memories that we've had at our church was on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, June and I were coming up 42, past the church, and uh, I said to her, was there anyone at the church when you left? And she said, no. And I said, well, there's two figures at the uh, contractor's trailer which was parked out here on the east side of the what is now the auditorium and they looked like they were trying to get into the trailer so we'd come around that was before they had the bridge on Stewart Road we came around and pulled right up to the trailer and they went two different directions I took off after the young man and ran him around the north side and he was about to cross Stewart Road and I grabbed him by the neck and June ran the other young man down the street over here in her in the automobile and found out where they lived. Later on, Pastor and I went down and, and uh, spoke with the parents. So we thought that was pretty funny. In 1976, a gymnasium was built. Someone here at Mansell Baptist Temple has been a big influence on my life is Chuck Riffle. Our gymnasium was named after him, but as a, as a child and a teenager, uh, he was... Uh, he was my youth director, uh, my bus director here at Mansfield Baptist Temple. I've seen him influence my mom and dad to get them involved here at Mansfield Baptist Temple, encourage them, lift them up. And he always answered the phone with, Jesus saves. And, uh, and to this day, I could call his house and he would answer the phone. This is Chuck Riffle, Jesus saves. And about four months after we were married, they were building the gym here at Mansfield Baptist Temple, and I was helping on the roof and I kind of stepped off the roof. There was a miscommunication, and I fell 29 feet, landing on both feet and on my back, and my legs and ankles were messed up. And we had a short honeymoon that way. <laughs> Our life changed forever from that day on. In the year of 1978, we hit bottom. I lost my job, Mansfield Tire closed. Uh, we lost the pastor. And that's when Dr. Folger came on, uh, was called to try to save the church, which he did. Times have not always been easy here, but uh, when uh, Pastor Folger was brought to our church to try out, my husband came home from a deacon's meeting and he said to me, everything is going to be okay. The time was the, wasn't always easy. We need a new pastor. Our pastor had left, and it was very hard at the time. And then when we started building on, it was a rough time when we headed on to the church. I came here in 1978 from Monticello, Kentucky. I came here as a favor, really, for Roy Thompson. Uh, he called and asked if I would consider coming here. I had really no interest, but as a favor, I came and preached. Uh, in view of a call. Uh, I didn't think they'd got call me. In fact, when I went home, I told my wife, they're not going to call me. He said, they're going to call you. I know they're going to call you. Uh, the second time I came, uh, Dean Manny told me, I said, we're going to vote on it, and we'll let you know. I went home again uh, and told her, I said, they're not going to call me. And she said, uh, they're going to call you. I know they're going to call you. So when they called, I told her, I said, we'll have to go because I know God must be in it. I didn't. I don't think they would call me unless God was in it. So they called me, and I, we came. I really didn't feel up to the job, but God equips who He calls. It began to grow. Uh, offers started coming in. 
we were able to pay off the debt that looked like it was impossible. God had blessed it a marvelous way. In 1984 and 1985, Brother Al Humble and Brother Dale Atkins joined the church staff. Brother Humble, who started as the youth director, continues to be the associate pastor and has been part of MBT staff for 29 years. Dr. Dale Atkins served as pastor of MBT for 18 years. We think one of the main successes of the church is the staff that we have here. They're dedicated men, they love the Lord, and they, they care. They want to make sure that as many people as possible hear the word. And we're just so fortunate to have a strong staff to lead us. From 1951 to present, there are cornerstones at MBT that have remained the same. Outreach and discipleship. I started attending uh, Mansfield Baptist Temple when I was nine years old. I was in third grade, and I remember uh, Mrs. Milligan was my first Sunday school teacher. But uh, my dad didn't come right away. Uh, we had a neighbor, Frances Bauer, that uh, invited us. Her daughter picked us up, put all five of us kids and our mom in their car, and brought us to Mansfield See, Baptist Temple for many uh, Due to visitation, someone came to my home and invited me to come. We began attending Mansfield Baptist Temple because of two men that came in our neighborhood uh, knocking on doors and asking people to come attend a new church that was starting in Mansfield. The key for our church to be a lighthouse in the community is to continue to knock on doors and try to see souls saved and reach the lost like we always have. When I'm out in the community, it's amazing to me when you knock on doors, you talk to people, you ask them, have you ever heard of Mansfield Baptist Temple? Have you ever been to Mansfield Baptist Temple? I run across so many people that have said that they went there on the buses when they were young. In some way, it almost seems to me that we have touched every life in Mansfield at times, but we need to keep on keeping on doing what we're doing and try to bring those lost souls to Christ. Faithfulness. We think some good advice for young couples when they're just getting started into church at MBT is commitment. We think that that's what it's all about. That's helped us through the first 52 years of marriage and to be consistent over and over. And that should follow right on through with church. It takes three services to thrive. Once every once in a while won't do it. You need to be in church. One way of being faithful is in your giving. And June and I, we were, we were saving money for a new home. And uh, the Browns were preparing themselves, Leonard and Maxine Brown were preparing themselves to go to the mission field. And we started praying about it, and the Lord laid it upon our heart to give what we had in the bank for a new home uh, to the Browns. It was, what, two or three months later, uh, first of all, I got, a new, I got a job at General Motors, and we were in a new home, uh, thanks to also Charles D uh, Dilley. He was the one that built the home. And uh, we were in a new home, and we just felt like this is what the Lord rewarded us with. We had no idea that that would happen, but uh, uh, we, were, we were very blessed. We were very thankful for it. And... Uh, we give God all the honor and the glory for it. Through our faithful giving, through tithing, um, some of the ways we've been seeing God's grace in that is through our upcoming wedding. Um, he's just been providing a lot of different areas, financial support, and through um, both of our schooling. The Lord has really blessed faith and I's faithfulness in giving in many different ways. And uh, he's just continued to provide for us over the past five or six months, I guess, as we're preparing for marriage. Um, some of the ways that God has blessed us is providing to get my car fixed back in January. He provided $800 and allowed me to have time to pay it back. Uh, he provided a scholarship for faith, a random scholarship just out of the blue. And then he also provided a love offering for me to, to help pay for my schooling. I've attended Mansfield Baptist Temple for approximately 35 years. We have been attending Mansfield Baptist Temple since 1953. We've been attending Mansfield Baptist Temple for 25 years. 56 years. 57 and a half years. One full year. Seven years. We have attended Mansfield Baptist Temple for over 40 years. We came here at the end of 1970. 
We've been going to the Mansfield Baptist Temple for 61 years. Involvement of people. Uh, we've been singing in the choir. Uh, that has helped us to really build some good uh, friendships and uh, have fellowship with a lot of the different people in the church. And then we're in charge of the Toppers, which is a senior group here at the church. And we really love these people and we really enjoy doing that. I've been involved in the choir and I really enjoyed singing with the group there in the choir. And uh, I uh, started teaching Sunday school and then a couple of weeks after I joined and I taught for 37 years and that was the kindergarten kids, the little four and five year olds. I'm involved in the sound ministry here at Mansfield Temple, uh, running the audio board and helping out with the video any way I can. I sing in the choir, I work in the nursery, basically anywhere. <laughs> Uh, the one reason that I'm in the bus ministry is because of my dad. And a lot of times I see teenagers and young people that are involved in the bus ministry. A lot of people say, well, they're just sitting there watching or not doing anything. Well, as a teenager, I sat there and watched my dad. And we're being watched as adults here at Mansfield Baptist Temple. Young people are watching us. And I believe that through watching my dad, it influenced my life to want to be a part of that. I've seen my dad visiting. I've seen my dad drive a bus. i see my dad being faithful here at Mansfield Baptist Temple. And that was passed on to me. Uh, my dad was by, in, by no means perfect. But uh, he was a man that was faithful to God in so many ways. And uh, I, I thank God for that. And I'm glad to be a part of the bus ministry to this day. And wisdom. Attend. And make that, make that the faithful thing of your family is we attend church. Everything else comes second place. We think some good advice for young couples when they're just getting started into church at MBT is commitment. We think that that's what it's all about. That's helped us through the first 52 years of marriage and to be consistent over and over. And that should follow right on through with church. Well, some of the things that have drawn us to Mansfield Baptist Temple are the loving people here Pastor Kurtz and the leadership that he provides and since he came in just some of the things that he's been doing here and also the fact that our church preaches the truth and we really hold fast to sound doctrine and to the King James Bible from 1951 to 2013 Ansfield Baptist Temple has stood the test of time people have been looking and searching for a place they can call home. In 62 years of ministry, Mansfield Baptist Temple continues to be called. Amazing. If I was to describe Mansfield Baptist Temple in one word for me, it would be home. And for me, it would be security. One word that describes Mansfield Baptist Temple is its home. It's a great church. We think it's, we describe the church as just a very caring church for people and souls. Honest. Family. Mm -hmm. If I could describe Mansfield Baptist Temple in one word, it would be family. Friendly. One word that describes the Mansfield Baptist Temple is, we'll forever be here. God established the church. I helped lay the cornerstone. And it's going to be here forever until Jesus comes back. As we abound and increase in the Lord, would you help Mansfield Baptist Temple be the lighthouse it has always been? For it is not finished. Pastor Kurtz, I think the best is yet to come. Amen. God's been good. Page number 253, if you would, let's stand. We're just going to sing one verse together before our final special, before our pastor comes. Page number 253, Lord, I'm coming home.
time Ms. Gene Hummel is going to come and sing a song entitled, He'll Be Enough. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I love the way that video ends. Brother Starnes had said those exact words to me out here uh, just a few weeks ago. And I said to Brother Humble when he was putting it together, I said, put that at the end of the video. I love that. The best is yet to come. And for those who are new in our church, can I challenge you about this? I challenge you to be part of the next 10, the next 20, the next 30 years of this ministry. And uh, jump in. And uh, let the Lord use you here at Mansfield Baptist Temple. Luke chapter 15. I'm going to begin reading in the 11th verse. The message is titled, Homecoming for the Prodigal. Homecoming for the Prodigal. If you have a bulletin in your bulletin, you'll see some notes as well as the initial passage that I'm going to read. In the Bible, they say that there are two stories that are the most well-known stories of the whole Bible. One of them is titled, The Good Samaritan. The second is this story, titled, The Prodigal Son. 
Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, the Bible says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. As we've begun reading this passage of scripture here, we've got this story of these two sons. They've got a dad. The younger one goes to dad and says, Dad, give me whatever I get for an inheritance. I want it now. And his dad says, okay, and he gives it to him. The son takes off. He makes a mess. He lives a riotous life. And he wastes everything. He spends it all. And he gets so low that he's in a pig pen. And he's ready to eat what the pigs eat. He's so low. And then the Bible says this in verse 17. And when he came to himself... He said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. He comes to the very bottom of the barrel, and the Bible says he came to himself, and he get, comes to this conclusion. He says, I got to go back to my dad. I got to go back. He's got servants that have bread enough and to spare. I'm perishing with hunger. I'm going to go back to dad. And I'm just going to say, Dad, I'm not even worthy to be your son. Will you just make me a servant? And so he sets out to go back there. Heavenly Father, Lord, in the next few minutes as we study this passage of Scripture, I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to hearts. Lord, I pray that each one of our listeners, both those who are in our auditorium, Lord, and those who are listening by means of the radio, Lord, I pray that each of us would open our hearts and say, God, speak to me personally. God, help me to see what you want me to see to learn what you want me to learn, to apply what I need to apply, to change where I need to change. Lord, I pray that you would bless this message in Jesus' name. Amen. When you open your Bible and you take your Bible and you begin looking through it, there are going to be times you're going to find in your Bible of people who were right where they should have been, in a great spot, and they left. They took off from a great spot. One of the stories that I think of uh, in that kind of a light is a story of this guy. He was a wealthy man. He was a powerful man. He was called a mighty man of valor. He was an honorable man, but he had leprosy. And he was sent to this prophet of God, and the prophet was going to help him. And the prophet tried to help him. The prophet said to him, he says, hey, if you'll go dip seven times in the Jordan River... When you come up after the seventh time, the leprosy is going to be gone. And guess how that guy responded? The Bible says he went away in a rage. He got mad. He goes, I'm not getting in that nasty Jordan River. I could have gone to those rivers there in Damascus if you want me to dip somewhere. He says, I'm not getting in that. He was right where he should have been. He got great advice. And he turned away. This story here is the story of a young man. He's in a perfect spot. He's got a dad who's the dad of all dads. He's got a great dad, a great situation. And he says, give me. Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. The first thing I want you to see is the departure of the prodigal. The prodigal was where he should have been, and he said, I'm getting out of here. He departed, he left. 
Can I tell you something? If you don't know this already, if you want to go away from the things of God, God will allow you to do so. He's not going to twist your arm. He's not going to force you. He allows us to choose. And this situation, this young man made his choice and he says, give me. I'm getting out of here. The departure of the prodigal is often followed by number two, the distance from the father. Now watch this. And the younger of them said to his father in verse 12, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. He said, get me away from dad. Get me away from everything I've been taught. Can I tell you something? When you make the decision to depart, Your next decision often is get me as far away as possible. You can be in church and you can choose to depart. And when you choose to depart in your mind soon after, you're going to say, I don't want to be in the church. I don't want to hear any of that. I want to be as far away from that as I can get. The departure of the prodigal was followed by the distance from the father. Let me read Isaiah chapter 30. For you In Isaiah chapter 30, beginning in verse 8, listen to these words. Isaiah 30 and verse 8 says this, Now go right before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. God says this, he says, here's the way a lot of people live. He said, this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. This is the person that says, get me away from the things of God. The Bible says in verse 15 then of Isaiah 30 says, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And ye would not. But ye said, No, for we will flee upon horses. Therefore shall ye flee, and we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. There are some individuals, and you might be sitting here today, you might be listening here, and you say, I've just chosen to run. I want to get as far away from the things of God as possible. I don't know why you're in church today. It may be that someone invited you in so that you could hear some things of God and maybe make the determination to come back to God. The departure of the prodigal is often followed by the distance from the father. But I want you to see when you make that choice, when you make the choice to run from the things of God, you'll next see the deprivation of the choice. How deprived you become when you go that route. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 22 says it this way. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. Will you stop and think about that for a minute? The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. When you choose to go away from the Father, to get as far as you can, you are going to deprive yourself of so many things. Because the blessings of this world, they come with sorrow. Oh, there are some things you can go that route and there will be a time. For this young man, there was a time. I'm sure he was having a good time. He was having a party. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. The problems began to mount. He wasted it all with riotous living. He spent it all. He wasted time. He lost influence. He missed out on memories. All those things he was deprived of because he went away. Listen, you can grow up in church. You can be in this church and you can be all a part of it. And you can make your choice. You're going to go. Go. The Lord will allow you to do so. Go as far as you can. 
The Lord will allow you to do so. But understand this, you are going to deprive yourself by that choice. You're going to miss out on so much. But I love this story because this guy found the proverbial bottom of the barrel. He found it. He got there. It may be that you're listening by means of our radio broadcast today and you say, that's me. I'm all the way down at the bottom of the barrel. Can I tell you something? Here's where you need to go next. Verse 17 says, and when he came to himself, I want you to see the determination to return. The determination, he said, I've got to go back. Now, I'll tell you something. This isn't easy. It's not easy to go back because there's one big thing you have to have. And that's a big helping of humility. In order for you to go back to the Father, you've got to have a big dosing of humility. You've got to humble yourself to go back. But this guy found the bottom of the barrel and he determined to return. Jeremiah 3.12 says, Go! And proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord. And I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord. And I will not keep anger forever. This guy came to the point, he had a determination to return. And when he did, I want you to see the difference of the approach. You see, last time he came to dad, look at his words to his dad in that 12th verse. He said, Father, give me. This time, when he got to his dad, which you see down in verse 21, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. The difference in his approach, he was ready to say, Make me as one of thy hired servants. You'll notice his dad didn't even let those words come out of his mouth. But he was ready to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. The difference of his approach. David said it this way in Psalm 51 and verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Let me tell you something. You want to make a great decision? Make the decision that you're going to go back to the Father. What a beautiful decision that guy made. And look at how different his approach was when he made that decision. He started out the first time, Father, give me. The second time, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And then I want you to see the Father's approach, the devotion of the Father. You see, he makes this determination. He came to himself. He got down to the bottom of the barrel. He says, I'm going to go back to dad. I'm going to go back to my father. And he did. The Bible says in verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. You see, it's one thing to say, I'm going to make that decision. It's another to do it. To make the decision to go, to get things right, to get back to the Father. You can be all talk. This guy wasn't. He arose. He came to his Father. But now watch the devotion of the Father. But when he was yet a great way off, his Father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. The devotion of the father. The Bible says it this way in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me. And I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You know, that young boy, he made a horrible decision. He went out 
And he made a mess. And he got so low, he got down into the pig pen. But he went back. And guess what dad did? The Bible says dad was watching for him when he was a great way off. His dad came running and hugged him and kissed him. And the son begins to speak. He didn't even get done talking. And dad says, nah, enough of that. You're my son. You're back. The devotion of the father. One, one commentator said it this way. This parable shows the Lord's readiness to welcome and bless all who return to him. This parable shows the Lord's readiness to welcome and bless all who return to him. You might be sitting here today and you, you be honest. You're standing before the father. You're not standing before me as a pastor. You're standing before the father. He's looking at you. He sees, he knows you might be in church today, but you know, you've gone a distance away. You've made choices that are pushing you farther and farther away. Why not run back to the Father? Look at His devotion. Look at His desire for you to return. The devotion of the Father. And then I show you this. The deliverance from past sin. The deliverance from past sin. Hebrews 8.12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities. Will I remember no more? The deliverance from past sin. The father cut off his repentant speech. Did you notice that? He was given a repentant speech and the dad cut it off. He said, Enough of that. I see you. I see your heart. I know you want to be back. You're my son. I'm thrilled. And they began to be merry. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful truth. But I give you one last thought. We look at this prodigal son, but if you know your scripture very well, you know that really this story isn't about the prodigal son. The story is really about the older brother. And the older brother's been there the whole time, and he's been doing what dad wanted him to do. He's been working there. And the younger brother comes home and they kill the fatted calf and the older brother's out working. And the older brother says, hey, to one of the servants, he goes, hey, what's the big deal? What's going on in there? And they tell him, they say, hey, your brother came home and we're having a big party. And he got mad. He goes, what are you having a party for him for? What about me? I've been here the whole time. What about me? Look what the Bible says in verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, thy brother has come. Thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And the dad says, And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meat. The word meat there, M-E-E-T, means appropriate. It was meat that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. The last thing I want to give you is the disgraceful behavior of the brother. The older brother's behavior was disgraceful. You see, this whole parable came about because of the first two verses of Luke chapter 15. You see, in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, it says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. The Pharisees and the scribes said, Why why is God letting those kind of people come to him? Why is Jesus letting these people, those sinners, come to him? So Jesus began to tell stories. He tells the story of this lost sheep and how there was one lost sheep and they went and got him and they were rejoicing because he was lost and found. Then he tells about a coin and how they found the coin there was rejoicing. And then he tells the story of the prodigal son. 
And he says, that's when you ought to rejoice. Mansfield Baptist Temple did not become the church that it is because we have a bunch of hooty snooties in the church saying, we don't want anybody else in this house. Don't let those kind of people in here. No, that's not what made, made Mansfield Baptist Temple what it is. What made this church is there's a bunch of people that says, come on in, come in. We want you to hear about a savior that died for your sins and wants to save you. That's what makes this church what it is. But is it possible that I could be like that brother and say, ooh, get those people out. Those people are sinners. By the way, the scribes and Pharisees were sinners too. They just didn't see their own sin. They were all worried about someone else's. And Jesus tells a story and he tells about this brother and he goes, it was meat. It was appropriate. This is the right thing to do is to rejoice. And can I tell you something? If you today come to this altar during the invitation and you bow your knee and humble yourself and come back to God, there's going to be a whole pile of people in here that said, it was me to rejoice. We're excited about that decision to run to Christ, to get out of the pig pen. I want you to see, last of all, three words in this story. In verse 17, well, let's go back to verse 19. In verse 19, the son, when he came, I want you to see three words that he used. The first word I want you to see is in verse 19, when he used the word unworthy. If you're going to come to Christ, this is how you need to come to him. You need to come understanding that you're unworthy. We are not worthy for what Christ does for us. Unworthy. Number two, you see in verse 18, He recognizes that he's a sinner when he says, I have sinned. Unworthy sinner. Verse 17. I want you to see the word perish. Perish. You see, when you come to Christ, you need to recognize we're unworthy. We're sinners. And without him, we perish. Is it possible that you would be here today and you would say, it's time for me to come to the Father? It's time for me. I've been running long enough. I've run out. I've made a mess. Or do you say, I like to wallow in the pig pen a little bit longer. I like to chew on a couple more a husk of corn before I take off. Oh, what are we missing out on when we do that? What if you today would say, I'm going to run to the Father. I'm going to humble myself and make the decision that God wants me to make. It may be that you're here today and you need to trust Christ as your Savior. You've never come to the, to the cross and said, I need the gift of eternal life. If that's you, today is the day. You ought to make that decision today. You may say, I've made the decision to trust Christ. I know I'm on my way to heaven, but I need to be baptized. I need to take that first step. That's what I need to do. If that's you, why not make that decision today? It may be you say, I've I've been saved. I've been scripturally baptized. I need to join the church. I need to be part of Mansfield Baptist Temple. Why not make that decision? It may be that you're here and you say, boy, I've been saved. I've been baptized. I've even been a member of this church. But I have to be honest. I've been running. I've been running. And it's time for me to humble myself and come back to the Father. Let's stand with you.